Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales of Demystified podcast. Today we're joined by David Thurin. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, so let's do yeah, that again because yeah, I don't want to get yeah. it right, get it wrong. Is it, is it Zur, Zurin? It's phonetic. It's Zwerin. Zwerin. Yeah. Should have got that. Okay, we're going to restart in three, two, one. Hello and welcome to another very special Sales Ops Demystified episode. Today we're joined by David Zwerin. David, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, John. Um, so it's always interesting to get sales ops people on that have sales experience. And David is one of those. But normally when we have people that have sales experience, they've, they have less experience in sales operations. But with David here, we have someone who has experience selling, but also now a decade of sales operations experience. So this is going to be an interesting discussion. David, why did you move from sales into sales ops? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I actually would say that sometimes sales operations found me. Um, so I, I didn't uh, make the, you know, the pivot intentionally, but, um, you know, I, I went to business school and found that, you know, obviously the, the sales experience, um, but also just the kind of the strategy um, of how to run a sales organization was really appealing to me. Um, so when I got into it, uh, somebody said, Hey, do you want to be in the engine room? Um, and that was, that was really appealing. So that's kind of how I, how I got into sales operations. It was a fairly new, um, I think kind of, uh, function within the organization, um, to really kind of help businesses, um, in terms of infrastructure, um, get built from kind of the ground up. Um, and really enjoyed the planning and, and strategy part of it. Sure, and you're right. I mean, when we started this podcast about 18 months ago, we kind of saw sales operations as like this new thing. But then obviously back then, it must have been like relatively unheard of to have a sales ops department. Yeah, it, it was... Uh, it, it was it was a very um, it was very project oriented um, in terms of you know the things that we did we ran comp plans we ran tools like Salesforce um, and the tech stack um, and you started to see the partnerships between the different um, parts of the organization so you know how does sales and marketing work together and how does sales and finance when they close a deal how do they work together. And you started to see the maturity of sales operations really take place um, as, uh, you know, as, as you start thinking about um, not only your own business, but the maturity of the business. Got it. And then if we zoom in to today, what's the current scale of your sales team and then the current scale of the ops team that's supporting that, the engine room, as you said? Yeah. So it's, uh, um, obviously a trip actions were, um, in a different climate today, um, than we were, but the scale that we had been on was uh, just an incredible tear. Um, and we were growing, um, uh, not only all of the different functions, but also, uh, globally, right? So, um, we had presence in the United States and presence in EMEA and in APAC. Um, and so when you think about what the scale of a sales organization and kind of that commercial footprint looks like, you have to support it um, from a sales operations or, or just an operational footprint. And there are two ways that I was approaching it. One was um, having functional support, but also regional support. So when you put sales operations people um, into a function, so for example, our SDR org was getting to be big. Um, you couldn't just have one person dedicate, you know, 30% or 40% of their time to making sure that their systems and the process that they were actually working on um, were actually um, uh, operational. There's so many different kind of changes or, um, you know, things that we want to set up in terms of process and maturity. So we would really try to aim to have a coverage ratio of ops to headcount um, that gave us obviously some flexibility over, um, you know, not only supporting that, but also supporting the new initiatives that we we're putting into place. Got it. And roughly what did that ratio range between as you were scaling? 
<laughs> yeah, it, it would, it, it, in the beginning, it was, it was very out of balance, actually. Um, we had, uh, it was, there was two of us in sales operations for about 125 people. So that's not a ratio I like and nobody likes in sales operations, but we actually were a lean, um, team doing great stuff. And then, um, and then we really start growing. And so, um, but I like to get the ratio right around one to 25 ish, um, if possible. Um, if not, um, if, if not, you know, even, even better ratio, like one to 15, but you know, that's a, that's a very, um, that's a very, what would, you know, heavy overlay, um, and cost to the business. So you want to try to do that as smart as possible. That's a good point. I not, I ask every interview this question, and I've actually found the average between one to fifteen to one to twenty. You guys were obviously like extremely efficient at one to sixty, um, yeah. but you're right. I didn't ever think about actually. Yeah, the the sales of resources have to justify their the extra efficiency gained per salesperson has to justify the cost of the sales of resource, right? And so I never really thought about it in that way. Yeah, you know, it's it's every role that we put in. So we, I, I scaled the the org, the operations org, in a couple of different ways. Um, but every time you put in a role, there has to be a business justification, and be very uh, crisp over what types of things that they are going to focus on. Um, and that's actually one of the key things about our business that you know every time we invested in a person or we invested in a program or a spend, um, it had to come obviously with very clear um, buy-in around kind of a, a business metric and ensure that uh, we're doing the right things. Got it. Um, current sales tech stack to trip actions, please. Yeah. Um, the, the tech stack is, is pretty, uh, I would say it's, it's pretty normal for a stage of, of our uh, size. Um, but, you know, our, our sales force um, is the core. Um, and uh, from there, we have um, outreach. We actually just moved over to, to outreach. Um, love the partners that we have at Sales Loft. It's just from, from our perspective, there's some scale. Um, and then we moved um, over to Zoom Info for most of our data enrichment. Um, uh, programs and so consolidated off of a few. Uh, we still use Lead IQ and LinkedIn, so as a really good um, kind of partnership there. Um, and Chorus, Chorus is a um, an amazing technology for us uh, in terms of really understanding what's happening on calls um, and doing our demos. Uh, and then we also use um, Atrium, um, Atrium HQ, which is a um, it's a it's a data um, and also strategy tool uh, for us as a business. And then obviously, you know, with the dashboards that we've got, we've got Tableau um, that plugs into everything, um, but it's really more of a dashboard than, um, than anything else. So at a high level, um, that's, our, that's our tech stack. I know I'm forgetting a few others, but um, those are more kind of like behind the scenes on how we do things. Got it. And I assume... Well, I'm assuming something here that maybe in the last few weeks, you or your team have been pushed to more remote work. Have you adopted any new tools or changed your process in any way to, to ensure productivity? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, you know, the things that, you know, we did before, you know, we had, you know, Google Sheets for tracking projects and also Asana for, you know, collaboration. But I think we kind of really moved um, more into Asana um, than, than in the past, just to really make sure that we had the right visibility. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, being kind of a highly distributed um, organization already, um, we actually had a, you know, a pretty good handle on, on working remotely or at least, you know, in different offices. I mean, yeah, and it's kind of an advantage, right? Because you guys, unlike your competitors, weren't... There's nothing slowing you down, right? Whereas let's say you had a competitor, it's very similar, but everyone within the same office. Over the past month or so, they, like, it's pretty chaotic, right? And so they'll be doing all this stuff where if you guys can just keep doing what you're doing, focusing and cracking on. Yeah, 
Um, there, yeah, it, but it's still, I think there's the human side of it, right. Um, where, you know, it's, uh, um, we, I, I am an in-office kind of person. Um, I love collaborating, you know, with people, there's nothing like getting real time, you know, feedback. We've, we sit in the pod turning you around, you know, we've got a team of, of five of us in our pod that we can just sit there and just, you know, ideate really quickly or do standups. Um, so I think there's a shift though. There's like an emotional and a mental shift that I think we all have had to take. For sure. Um, cool. Now you were saying just now about how whenever you're bringing a new person into a team, there has to be some kind of justification, right? If you're going to be paying this sales off person's salary. Um, and therefore I assume you, when you have improved the productivity or done some, something good for the reps, you would track this and then record it. Right. And so my question is, can you share a time where you or someone within the sales ops team has done something that has like measurably improved the sales people's performance? Um, sure. Just like a real specific program. Yeah. Um, we, we actually, um, you know, had been trying to find the right formula of um, our dashboarding and what we would say, like kind of the manager level um, uh, metrics in terms of how you run, you know, a playbook with standard one-on-ones with your teams because we're scaling so much. Um, and how do we enable those managers to be better about the data and really understanding it because managers don't typically spend the time analyzing data. And so what we did is we ran a program. Um, I, I led this initiative with Atrium, Atrium HQ. So this is like a little mini commercial, unfortunately for them, but fortunately. Um, uh, but what happened was we did this. Um, uh, we really looked at the commercial segment because it's a highly transactional uh, part of our business. and. Um, with that, you really need to have salespeople who know how to manage their pipeline um, and really know how to manage, you know, their their activity. So they manage their whole kind of day and their time. So, you know, they can have the right activity to drive, you know, um, interests and know the tools. Um, and then once those opportunities are in, how do they actually bring those all the way through to the pipeline and close? So what we did is we created this really structured um a program with their CS team um, to come in and work with every commercial manager throughout the globe and make sure that they're using all of the same KPIs and measuring, you know, what those effectiveness on those one-on-ones. And and what happened was the commercial team became much more efficient. They're hitting numbers that they had never hit before um, in terms of, you know, closed one, but also number of opportunities that were coming in, um, which is a big KPI for us is the number of ops that we get. Because, you know, again, you know, customer acquisition is probably, you know, the name of the game for us because there's not much in terms of land and expand uh, for our business. So those are real, that was one of the, like the, the biggest key uh, programs that we just recently kind of we've, we've run it um, and we're starting to see awesome results. And so um, until obviously recently um, where, you know, things are obviously changing in the travel landscape. Of course. Um, so you, you made a structured sales process and then you were ensuring managers were tracking that using Atrium HQ, and that that focus and visibility improved reps' performance, especially with customer acquisition. It improved the manager's ability to be effective in their coaching. Absolutely, got it. Um, it told them where to go, where to focus, what's happening week to week, or against their peers um, for those individuals, and just say, "Hey, here, here, are three or three or four or five crisp things to work on, and things that are working." So those are like, you know, the, the, the best part of how you make not only your teams better, but also how you can really help managers become like great managers. I think one of the most un kind of tapped um, part of sales organizations is actually having manager enablement um, and knowing where, where they should focus. Managers have come from places where like they are super sellers. 
they're the ones who know how to close the business. So, you know, when things get bad, they buy us into becoming that super seller, right? And so if you can really help them pull back and, and do their job effectively, then everything really obviously starts to kind of fall into place. This is a super interesting point. I've never heard the word manager enablement before, but I totally get it because often the person who's promoted to manager is the best seller if they don't want to take the individual contributor route. And just because they're a great seller, there's two things. One, they could fall back into the I'm a great seller when things are going badly. Then also it doesn't mean if they're a great seller, it doesn't mean they're a great manager. Um, right. And so this is a great term. This is a great new term for the sales world, I think. We're coining it now. Okay, good. I, I, I was fortunate I heard that a while ago in my career. So I'm, I'm glad you're going to carry that torch. Because I think it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's such a, um, it's such an important thing, um, you know, for in our business, because we were promoting our top sellers into these, you know, into these first time manager roles. Um, and, you know, it, it's that, it's that they knew the tribal knowledge of the, of the, of the business and they, they have the information and it's all about how you can obviously, you know, um, enable the sale, the sellers that are underneath them, but then how you enable those managers to become even more successful in their kind of new career. For sure. Now you may have already touched upon this, but if you could only measure one sales related metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? Uh, um, it's a great question. I mean, I, I would say, um, um, I would say something along the lines of customer retention, um, because it speaks volumes to what people are doing, um, that if you develop the right relationship, um, with, uh, a buyer, an executive buyer or a champion. Um, and, you know, you've really helped them solve the pain that they have and made their lives in terms of what they've done um, better uh, for them and their business. Customer retention is probably the biggest, most important thing to the business. It's, you know, it's an un, it's a, it's really funny. It's like, you know, you can sell, you can be the best seller in the world. You can sell millions of dollars worth of business, but if they're leaving in the back door, that means you haven't done your job. And, got, and the, the, there's an argument here that this metric is a result of both the selling and success, which I guess in some cases is always done by the account manager throughout the process, but also is often handed off from the rep to the customer success person. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, if you, so in our business is uh, we were a consumption model. So if the seller does their job and they have a good handoff process and they work through the launch and they make that a successful launch, um, that is, you know, they've done their job and, and they've done the handoff, um, in the right way. Got it. Okay. So, and I assume that's a commission event post launch when post launch. Correct. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And so there is some accountability path, like I've agreed to buy. You, the seller is also there up until, well, during the implementation phase. Got yeah. It. So, you, yeah. no, go for it. Um, so one quick question on this. Are you guys as sales ops also interacting and working with the success team? Yeah, you know, for, for a time, um, I, uh, on our earlier stage, I ran the CS ops function as well. So standing up um, all of, you know, the metrics, we actually brought in Gainsight. Um, and um, we were, we were, we were using a kind of an open source platform to measure the business. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, today, we actually partner very closely with, with CS Ops on, you know, process, excuse me, and programs, um, and really trying to embrace the customer 360 um, in terms of you bring somebody in and and what and what are they doing and who actually is owning the relationship. So inside of Salesforce, it's really important for us to be able to have that you know ability to kind of look and see what's um, um, what the current status is of a customer. Got it. Yeah, I think if 
so crucial for that integration between the sales and CS ops. And he's also, I think we're seeing revenue ops, right? Where they're essentially yeah. responsible for both. Um, yeah. Awesome. Now, final question, who in your career has taught you the most or inspired you the most in sales operations? Yeah. Um, that it's a great question. Um, it's like this collective wisdom um, that I've been been able to, I think, be able um, uh, to learn from. Um, as a, as I think a lot about, you know, who um, who my mentors are, and you know, I think of people um, probably not in sales ops, um, but you know, somebody who has really influenced me. Um, early in my career as a sales leader, um, who was very operational. And um, um, I, I would say like those types of people have, have really kind of helped shape, you know, you know, the things that, that I challenge every day in terms of looking at data differently. Um, do you want me to tell you the name of a person or persons? Uh, yeah, one, one or two would be great. Yeah. So um, I would say, you know, probably my the first sales leader that I had who really <clears throat> kind of shaped my kind of my thinking. And his name was Jim Drill. Um, and he came from a long line of, you know, operators at a company um, called BMC. Um, and there was a gentleman who ran the sales organization there who really just instilled a, an amazing operational rigor um, among his sales leaders. And so he, he just basically was able to share that with me, which is, which is great. Um, and then uh, the other who I just obviously thoroughly enjoy when I get time with um, is uh, he's, he runs, he actually runs Atrium and, and Modern Sales Pro and that's um, Pete Kazanjay. Um And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's refreshing to be able to sit down and kind of just like, as he says, geek out um, and talk, talk shop. Uh, about what you know, what's what what the what the pulse and the current trends are out there, which is fun. Yeah, we've got to get someone from Modern Sales Pros on. A number of people come on and talk about the, those guys. Um, and then it was, was it Jim Drill at DMC. Well, at BMC. Um, BMC. That's what, yeah, but that that was a long time ago. That was early in his career. Um, but when I worked with him at Lithium Technologies. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Now I've got a page for the notes here. Um, the things I liked, I like that we're now coining, I, and I know someone might have told, someone's already coined this, but I'm, we're, we're coining it now, which is manager enablement, because um, I think it's such an important point. Um, and then I also enjoyed your, your commercial understanding of bringing in a sales ops person or having to justify bringing in more people to increase your ratio Obviously, you guys have gone from like one to 60 down to one to 15, right? Um, yep. But ensuring that you're going to the business and justifying why you need this person and how you're going to improve revenue with the effective person. Um, and then the final point about the, the, how retention is so important. Uh, and it's not just a salesperson to get someone to sign. It's not, it's not just a salesperson's role to get someone to sign and then running away because that is not ultimately going to help the business and actually ensuring the salesperson's there for a successful launch is going to be crucial for that retention. David, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for having me. It's been a pleasure.